The objective of this video is to introduce the circuitry required to operate switches of the single pole double throw converter. We're going to do this by considering the single pole double throw converter with a bi-directional pole current realization. I'd like you to take a second now, pause this video, and draw what this single pole double throw converter will look like when the switch is replaced by a bi-directional realization. If this is difficult for you, I suggest that you go back and review our semiconductor realization unit. So you can now see the single pole double throw switch realized with a bidirectional power pole current has a MOSFET in the top and bottom. This could be a MOSFET, this could be an IGBT, this could be a BJT. Here I've decided to draw it as a MOSFET. And we're going to talk about how you produce the voltage that's required to turn on and turn off the gate of the MOSFET. So in a typical situation, you have a duty ratio that you want to realize for each of the switches. You want that switch to be on some D percent of time, where D is your duty ratio. And this duty ratio has been generated by some type of controller. And this may be an analog circuit, or it might be a portion of a digital program inside a microcontroller. If it's an analog circuit, it might take on the value of 0 to 1 volt, or it might take on some arbitrary range of values. Let's say it's 0 to V peak volts. And this voltage would be referenced against the common of our circuit. And specifically at this point, let's talk about the top switch of our converter. We now need to convert this analog signal, which is our duty ratio, into a digital signal, which is the MOSFET on and off time. So specifically we want to go from the analog signal all the way to the voltage that we're going to be applying at the gate of the MOSFET. The first step in this is to compare our duty ratio signal against a carrier waveform. So if this is an analog circuit, we would make use of a, comparator, a comparator integrated circuit. If this is a digital circuit, if this is something in our microcontroller or in an FPGA, we can do the same thing, but using firmware. So the comparator is going to compare our analog duty ratio against a carrier. In this case, I'm sketching our carrier as a sawtooth waveform, and I'll sketch the duty ratio in blue. So the sawtooth waveform has a magnitude of V peak. This is the maximum value that our duty ratio can take on. The frequency of our carrier is actually our switching frequency for our converter. The idea of this circuit is, is, is that it will output a logic high level whenever the duty ratio is greater than the carrier, and a logic low level whenever the duty ratio is less than the carrier. So what I've drawn inside this box is actually a graph of a waveform in time, where we're showing both our duty ratio and our carrier. And this is called a comparator integrated circuit. And the output of our comparator is a digital signal that is referenced, again, to the common of our logic circuit. And this can take on the value of perhaps 0 to 1.8 volts, where it's at 1.8 for a logic high, 0 for logic low. It could be 0 to 3.3 volts, 0 to 5 volts. It can be any standard logic level that you've designed your circuit for. This signal, at this point, is a, is a modulated signal, it's a pulse width modulated signal that is intended to turn our MOSFET on and off. However, the actual voltage that's required across the gate to source the MOSFET may differ from the logic levels. You have to refer to the manufacturer's data sheet to determine what values of gate source voltage you require for your MOSFET. If it's a silicon carbide MOSFET, it may need plus 18 volts to turn on, and it may be recommended to turn off at minus 5 volts. If it's a silicon MOSFET, it might be 0 to 12 volts. If it's an IGBT, you may have a, a different range altogether. So you need some kind of circuit to convert this logic level signal into the actual voltage that should be applied across the gate to source of your MOSFET. And this circuit is called a gate driver. So the gate driver on its input side will be connected to the power source for the logical and connected to the common 
of our logic circuit as well. So it reads in this MOSFET digital signal of 0 to 1.8 or 0 to 3.3 volts, and it's going to output a signal to the gate of the MOSFET. But that signal needs to be referenced to the MOSFET source. And this is a very important point. If we look back at our circuit on the top, we can see that we're at this point considering the top MOSFET and its source voltage is the same as the pole of our single pole double throw switch, which is to say that the source of the MOSFET is not at a consistent voltage value. At some points it's at zero volts, at other points it's at our throw voltage, depending on whether the pole is connected to throw one or throw two. So our gate driver has to be able to provide a consistent gate voltage relative to the source of the MOSFET, which means that it, it needs to isolate the signal going to the MOSFET from the logic signal, which is always referenced to a, a, a stable logic common. On the input side of our gate driver, all of our signals are, are referenced to the common of the logic circuit, while on the output side of our gate driver, all the signals are referenced to the source of the MOSFET. So we have an isolation boundary. And how this isolation boundary is formed uh, can vary. It can be an opto-isolator, where in fact your MOSFET uh, signal is a optical signal from an LED and on the output side of the driver you have a photodiode that receives that optical signal. It can be magnetic coupling, it can be capacitive coupling. The point is is that we are isolating the two sides so that we can have a different reference for each side. And in order to do this we need to provide a power source for our gate driver side. A power source that is isolated from the logic signals, but referenced to the source of the MOSFET. That means that we end up requiring a gate drive power supply for each of the MOSFETs. So this whole situation repeats again for the bottom MOSFET. That is to say, we have an incoming duty ratio, which we will reference to the common. We'll send it into a comparator, and we'll send it into a gate driver for the bottom MOSFET. So we can summarize the features that the gate driver provides for us, or the functionality that the gate driver provides as follows. It first pro provides isolation between the logic signals and the power circuit. And we motivated this by discussing the need to have an isolated source voltage for the source of our MOSFET. Um, because our MOSFET source voltage may vary from may vary along with the pole voltage if you're talking about the top MOSFET. <clears throat> but we can also consider it from the perspective of a safety concern. The power circuit is connected to presumably rather high power levels relative to the very low power circuitry that's required with generating control signals. So this is both for operational reasons as well as for safety. We'll say safety slash noise immunity reasons. The second key functionality that our gate driver provides is that it translates our logic level voltages to the voltages that are required for our specific switch, whether this is an IGBT, a silicon MOSFET, a BJT, or a silicon carbide MOSFET. And we remarked that we need to provide an isolated power source for each switch, or for the gate drive of each switch. The final functionality that the gate driver provides us that our control circuit can't provide us is the required current to turn on and off our switches. So suppose hypothetically that the output of your comparator was able to both be isolated and provide the required voltages to turn on and off our MOSFET. In most practical circuits, this still wouldn't work because the gate of your MOSFET or your IGBT requires significant charge to be built up and removed in order to turn the device on and off in a reasonable amount of time. So a key functionality of the gate driver is that it is capable of driving a very large current for very short periods of time to turn the MOSFET gate on and off. And that concludes this video lecture.